You're listening to podcasts from the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, www.netcaucus.org. Hi, um, my name is Tim Gordon, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, this briefing today is called the FCC's Grand Internet Plans, the Open Internet, and Massive Mobile Spectrum Auctions. What do you need to know? And the reason we did this is because yesterday uh, the Federal Communications Commission issued um, two plans um, dealing with um, uh, an open internet or so-called net neutrality, along with um, a, a massive plan to roll out more spectrum for our mobile phones and mobile devices so we have better broadband when, we, when we're on our mobile devices. So um, they're both massively significant. Um, they're really important to the growth and vibrancy of the Internet, no matter which way you feel about that particular issue. And we wanted to brief folks, consumers, um, and members, members of Congress and staff um, on the developments. So that's what we're doing here today, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The hashtag for today, we're going to use pound FCC net neutrality just because, and um, we're our next briefing um, going forward is probably next Friday. We may have to find a room for it, but it'll be on the efficacy of the NSA surveillance plan. So that'll be next Friday, probably in Rayburn, but I'll, I'll send out a notice about that. Um, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to start, we're going to bifurcate this into first talking about the open, the FCC's open internet plan for the first like kind of half hour or so. Then we're going to pivot um, to a couple of speakers to kind of lay out um, the, the mobile spectrum auction issue. We'll try to do some Q&A in, uh, at the end of each session, so please feel free to um, uh, ask any questions you like. If you need more chairs, there's a whole stack of them in the corner and you can kind of pull them out and sit anywhere you like. And there's a couple of, there's three in, up here in the front row if you, if you need to. Um, really quickly, let me introduce our, our speakers on the first session, and that's going to be on the open internet order. Um, on my far right, we have Matthew Brill, who's a partner at Latham & Watkins. He's formerly from the Federal Communications Commission, working for uh, Commissioner Abernathy. Then we have um, uh, uh, Sarah Morris, um, who is um, who's with uh, the New America Foundation. And don't, don't be con- congressional staff, there's the head of congressional relations, is also named Sarah Morris, but they're totally different people. So just, just keep that in mind. This is not the Congressional Relations FCC Sarah Morris. Um, then we have Mark Emerickson, who's a partner at Steptoe and Johnson, and uh, Gus Hurwitz, who's the assistant professor at the University of Nebraska College of Law. So we're really, we're really you know, diverse set of speakers, different views on the subject, um, and, and we'll just get going really quickly. I'm going to ask, so if anybody doesn't hasn't heard about net neutrality or what it is, I don't think we really need to go into too much detail on um, what it means, but basically it's the idea that um, on the internet, as consumers access content, that everybody should have their, their applications, their, their, their services, all be treated kind of equally. Um, and, and how that happens, and the legal authority for which, has been a tortured uh, conversation over the last, um, at least since 2005, we've been doing these briefings. Um, so um, let me just, just really quickly, I think, the, the FCC kind of, they lay out their plan yesterday, Chairman and Wheeler had a vote on his notice of proposed rulemaking, and I'm going to ask um, Matt to tell us how we kind of got here. And we were here um, in January like 17th um, after the D.C. Cir- DC Circuit Court uh, struck down the, the previous FCC chairman's plan for the open internet, and this is like another crack at it, um, t- taking kind of cues from the D.C. Circuit, circuit Court's decision and trying to rewrite it. So Chairman Wheeler, the FCC chairman, had a vote, three to, three to two, or at least um, two in favor, one concurring, uh, and two against vote. Um, and then we're going to ask... Um, us to kind of lay out what happens now, um, and then we'll go into some discussion. Um, so, so Matt, if you could, if you could tell us kind of how we got here, um, which is very quickly, so we have a context for understanding the discussion and what the what the FCC did yesterday. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and just so everyone knows where I'm coming from, I I've been involved in these issues for a long time. I was at the FCC from 2001 to 2005, and really worked on some of the early proceedings that that gave rise to some of today's discussions, and since that time, I've been working in private practice representing a lot of network owners who have strong interest in this, cable operators, wireless providers, and others. Um, I, I'll try to get through the background a little quickly, because I think it's helpful to understand how we got to today, and one of the points I want to start with is, is back to 2002, when the FCC first confronted how to classify broadband services provided over cable networks, cable modem services, as they were often called at the time. And the big debate at that time 
was whether these services under the Communications Act of 1934, as it was amended in 1996, uh, whether these services should be considered telecommunication services subject to Title II of, of the Communications Act or instead information services, which are generally regulated and, and are often referred to as, as Title I services. And the distinction between those labels is important. They're mutually exclusive categories. Telecommunication services basically consist of pure transmission. So telephone services are the archetype, and more advanced data services can be telecom services when they're really moving information from point A to point B without any change in the content. Um, and in contrast to that, information services consist of transmission plus information processing. So when you're when you're retrieving stored information, when you're when you're acting on that information in some way, uh, it's considered an information service under the statute. And what the FCC said in 2002 is that broadband internet access, when provided over the cable networks, was an information service and only an information service. That while transmission was involved in providing this, the transmission of information between uh, remote servers, the internet service provider, and the end user, the FCC determined that the service, when viewed as a whole from the consumer's perspective, should be regulated as an information service and therefore not subject to Title II. And what that meant in practical terms is that traditional common carrier obligations of non-discrimination, the obligation to provide just and reasonable services, regulation of, of service quality, none of those common carrier mandates applied to broadband internet access. And in the wake of that ruling, it went, ultimately went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld that decision in a case called Brand X. The FCC started to think about what sorts of protections might accompany an information service. The, the initial debate was really not about uh, rules for protecting consumers. The, the early debates were known as open access debates. Other Internet service providers, like Earthlink, wanted to make sure they had a right of access to serve customers over a cable operator's network or over a telephone company's network, and there were lots of debates about whether the FCC should compel broadband providers that own networks to open up those networks so that third-party ISPs would be able to step in and serve the customer. And, and those mandates were never adopted, although they were de debated for years. And, and and what really emerged was was the, the early foundations of today's net neutrality debate. So we had, we had principles at first, uh, that consumers should have access to content of their choosing without being blocked by their internet service provider, that they should have access to services, be, be able to attach devices that don't harm the network, and eventually uh, the FCC codified a set of principles in 2005 that weren't binding but were uh, a statement of, of the expectations of the agency uh, and an understanding that the commission would monitor developments in the industry. Uh, when when uh, there were allegations uh, several years later that Comcast had throttled uh, traffic that was peer-to-peer -peer traffic using the BitTorrent protocol. The commission brought an enforcement action against Comcast under the, the policy statement from 2005. That resulted in the first court case in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals the Comcast case where the court struck down that order saying that the FCC didn't have binding rules in place and hadn't justified under the statute its enforcement action against Comcast. And while that case was pending, the FCC had proposed its open Internet rules uh, that resulted in the 2010 open Internet order. And and that case uh, went up to the D.C. Circuit again and, and was reversed in part in the Verizon decision. The FCC up, uh, was upheld in, in its transparency requirements requiring broadband providers to disclose important information about their practices, but it's regulations that, that prevented blocking of Internet traffic and that prevented discrimination uh, in, in various forms were, were remanded to the agency, and that, that has brought us to, to yesterday's uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. So I'll, I'll hand it off to Gus at this point to talk about the process going forward. Well, uh, before I get to Gus, um, the, the part of the process allows me to save a little bit of face because I forgot in my opening to, to – to talk about our process, which is uh, we, we, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee hosts these events in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus itself and, and, and its chairs, uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte here in the House and Congresswoman Anna Ashu. The Senate side co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. The proposition here for this particular program is that we don't, the organization does not take any positions on legislation. This is a really good, or, or regulation, this is a really good issue to, to kind of illustrate that. Um, we All we do is host, uh, as a platform, just balanced discussions on these issues, um, pros and cons, because the Internet is, is astoundingly important and it needs to be preserved and, and cherished. So um, I, I applaud and, and 
thank the Congressional Inter Caucus and its co-chairs um, for supporting this program. Um, even though the co-chairs themselves um, disagree on these particular issues, um, I really would like to thank them and, and just explain that that is our particular process. And um, as far as the process for the FCC, Gus. Okay, so uh, to start in a similar vein uh, as a little bit of introduction, again, my name is Gus Horowitz. I am a uh, assistant professor of law at the University of Col uh, Nebraska College of Law, where I teach telecommunications, internet law, and regulation. And we have a great program with some really outstanding graduates doing important work in these fields. That's a quick plug because Sarah is one of our graduates. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the process moving forward. I want to quickly start by putting a pin in the, the last um, point about the Comcast case. It's a really interesting question that we might want to come back to of how the Comcast case might have come out had the FCC previously interpreted Section 706 as applying to uh, the Internet. So in the Comcast case, it had previously said that it didn't apply. So we might want to come back to that question. But the process moving forward. So what happened on, uh, on Thursday? The commission voted to adopt the notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, this is, as the chairman has been very clear over the last couple of weeks, the real beginning of the process. Um, it's a bit peculiar... Um, the discussion that we've been having over the last several weeks about um, the NPRM because it was leaked prior to the commission meeting where it was supposed to be discussed and adopted. So all of the public input that's been happening over the last several of weeks and public discussion is somewhat has been premature until today. Um, so what happens when the commission adopts an NPRM? For those of you, and I expect, I hope most of you in this room are familiar with the Administrative Procedure Act, the APA. This is governed by um, ordinary agency procedure that applies to all agencies um, for the most part. Um, the agency has adopted proposed rules. At this point, a public comment period is open. Um, the rulemaking process here is referred to as notice and comment. The agency has given the public notice and now is waiting for comment. Um, over the next approximately 60 days, between now and July 15th, um, the agency will be accepting public comment. Um, following that, uh, we'll have about another 60 days through September 10th. It's a 120-day period for reply comments. So um, the public can submit replies to the comments that have been uh, uh, submitted prior to uh, July 15th uh, through September 10th. So it's, it's probably too early to suffer from FCC fatigue. <laughs> It's never, never <laughs> appropriate to suffer from FCC fatigue. And there'll be, there'll be members that'll be, you know, signing letters and writing uh, during this process and, and submitting comments and reply comments during the entire time, as well as holding hearings. I think House Energy and Commerce is holding a hearing on Tuesday, uh, May 10th. Right, and one of the really interesting things that uh, the FCC has done, given the public's really uh, substantial interest in the subject, they have been adopting um, non-standard uh, mechanisms for the public to submit comments. So there is an email address, which I assume will be uh, continue to be used through the uh, public comment period, where the public can email comments instead of having to go through the uh, ordinary electronic comment filing system. So that, that's an interesting procedural innovation that the FCC has put in place. So what happens after all these comments are received? Um, September 10th, the comment period will close, and the commission will do one of three things. Either it will throw its hands up in the air and say, you know, forget about it. We're not going to make rules here. That's unlikely to happen. It could happen. Um, the next alternative is the commission will take a look at all the comments that have been received. It will go back and deliberate and start drafting a final rule, um, and that final rule will be issued probably sometime by the end of the year. I think uh, the chairman really wants to have this off of his desk by the end of the year. Um, and uh, the final rules that are issued will need to... Uh, be foreseeable from the proposed rules that were announced yesterday. So they either need to be the same as those rules, they need to have been noticed in the NPRM, or they need to be a, quote, logical outgrowth of what is in the NPRM. 
So the commission can't just make up new rules. They need, they need to be a logical outgrowth of uh, what was announced yesterday. The so, can I ask a question? Yes. So if, if we talked about 706 um, authority that was granted in um, the, the Telecom Act of 96, and then also Title II, which is kind of, the, as Matt explained, as well, a telephone service type um, thing, there, there's opens for, openings for both of those. Um, this NPRM allows them to do either of those things. Correct. So to be a bit more precise, the NPRM itself currently is proposing to use Section 706, but it's accepting comment on the use of either Title II or other uh, possible sources of authority, including Title III for um, wireless and some uh, so-called hybrid approaches, such as those um, submitted to the agency by uh, Mozilla and, uh, as the FCC refers to them, uh, certain professors from Columbia University. Um, I, I think most people know which professors those are. Um, uh, since it has ex- uh, requested comment on Title II, it would uh, clearly be a logical outgrowth. We probably okay. wouldn't even, even need to go through So they have both options. options. Right. They could do both options. Um, so the, the third option that the FCC could do after uh, the September 10th deadline is they could say, okay, we need to think about this more. We're going to issue a further notice of proposed rulemaking, an FNPRM, which is really just another NPRM. So the, what happened yesterday will happen again, and we'll go through another comment cycle. Um, and that can happen many, many times. It probably isn't going to happen in this case. The uh, NPRM that was issued yesterday is really very good in outlining uh, possible avenues. Okay. Um, there, there's some interesting things done in there, but we don't need to get into them now. Okay. So uh, just just to really quickly summarize, um, the the looks like the NPRM suggests for Open Internet, um, there's kind of a consumer choice. Um, the consumer should have the choice of services and have a well, kind of almost like consumer bill of right of, uh, for consumers of what, what they can get and what, what, um, what, what they can access and at what speeds. There's kind of a node blocking rule, which is consistent with the last last attempt at this thing. There's um, there's some kind of limits on prioritization, and that's a that's a big question we want to get into. Um, Chairman Wheeler said there'll be no internet fast lanes, and actually, before he stopped speaking, I saw a headline in the Washington Post that was um, that said the FCC is going to do fast lanes. Um, so I'm not. I, we want to debate discuss that. Um, and then there's the transparency, the enhanced transparency element. Matt, I, I think it laid out what the transparency element was before, and then. And there's going to be some kind of consumer, or a, uh, actually a, in, uh, a startup, business, consumer, ombudsman for complaint resolution. Um, and so you could dis- you could dispute these things and, and, and ask for permission to do certain things for the FCC. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, right? You guys could explain it all much better than me. But let me just ask you, you know, how do you how do you feel like this either enhances or uh, preserves net neutrality in op- the open internet, or is really a disaster for ISPs and, and consumers and innovation on the internet? Now, let's start with Tara. Well, um, this is, uh, sorry, I'm Sarah Morris. I am the Senior Policy Counsel for the Open Technology Institute at the New America Foundation. And we've been longtime advocates for um, open Internet protections, also known as net neutrality. I think we'll probably, those words will both get, or phrases will both get tossed around here. Um, and we come at this with um, a very strong concern that um, the Internet is not just a platform for innovative new business models, but also a platform for innovation itself and for um, unfettered communications access among um, users. Um, as the um, as Commissioners Rosenworcel and Clyburn pointed out yesterday very compellingly, um, this is not just about companies, um, this is about consumers and users and um, their ability to participate civically, um, socially, and to generally communicate with one another online. So... <laughs> To answer your question about um, what this means for the future of the open internet and our general reactions, I think that this um, this rulemaking, while quite comprehensive <laughs> in, the, in the questions, um, predicates the the framework for the commission's new net neutrality rules on a um, legally shaky ground, and also. Um, the framework itself is uh, difficult to apply in real life and um, will not afford the same types of protections that we saw um, in the 2010 order from the Commission. So we are thinking very critically about what this means um, for the, the 2010 rules, how those have changed, and I'm sure we'll go into this in much more detail, but um, 
our reaction now is that um, there's still a long ways to go. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Mark Americks with Steptoe and Johnson, and um, as a as a communications lawyer, I'd first say that I, th- I think this NPRM is is a phenomenal document. It's 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 really if you're thinking about getting into communications law or your communications lawyer, it it has everything you'd want to have to tackle. Um, it's uh, raised intriguing questions from policy questions to legal questions and technical questions. Um, Everyone believes in an open Internet. Uh, that was clear in the meeting uh, Thursday, the commissioners. And um, But this really is so complicated that I thought it's worth unpacking a bit what's in controversy and what's largely not in controversy. And even though my notes start with what's in controversy, I thought I'd start with what's generally not in controversy. And based on the prior court cases we've seen, uh, statements already that are submitted in the docket and, and what's in the NPRM. And what's not in controversy... Are, are really two things. One is the virtuous circle theory, the theory that uh, the animating theory for the 2010 rules, uh, that openness uh, contributes to a virtuous circle of consumer broadband adoption, uh, innovation by Internet companies, and investment by cable and phone companies in the network. And the um, FCC goes through some examples of what's happened since 2010 that, that further shore up that, that, um, that theory. And the D.C. Circuit was very clear on this point that they thought the FCC had adequately uh, explained that reasoning and justified it. Um, the second issue that's largely not uh, in controversy is that absent rules, broadband Internet access providers have the incentive and ability to um, – to um, uh, limit openness. And again, the D.C. Circuit found that the Commission adequately supported and explained their uh, reasoning that absent rules, uh, broadband Internet access providers would have such incentives to degrade the Internet. So then we get into, well, what's really at controversy then? Um, So what's in controversy are um, essentially two things. First is whether and how to prevent paid prioritization. And the FCC is clear on this. They want to ask whether there should be paid prioritization on the Internet, whether that should be a model that the FCC adopts, and if so, how they adopt that. Um, is, that the, is that the kind of fast lanes that we've been hearing about? That I, it, it's, I, I hesitate to ca- characterize it as fast lanes because I'm not sure how, whether you would, how you describe those except for how the rule describes those and, and, and what the, what the NPRM proposes is a base level of service and then encourages individual negotiations for paid arrangements. Um, the second piece that's, that's at controversy is what parts of the internet ecosystem that touch broadband internet access should be subject to the rules. Um, there's wireline internet access, which is your, your cable or DSL internet access. There's mobile internet access, which is how you get to the internet through your, your cell phone. And, um, and then there's some folks, uh, that are interested in also, um, addressing where the cable company or the phone company's, uh, broadband internet access service attaches to the internet itself. So those three th- categories, I think, will also be debated in the docket on, on how the, um, on how this, on, on where this rules should apply, uh, the commission has largely uh, the commission has said they're not going to uh, change the scope in that regard of the 2010 rules. That the rules will apply to wireline broadband internet access with regard to mobile internet access. The rules will prevent a mobile internet access provider from blocking websites and blocking applications that compete with mobile telephony services. Uh, but they will not get into um, uh, discrimination issues, uh, which which largely aren't in play uh, if the commission adopts its current framework anyway. Uh, and then the second issue, the, so the first issue at controversy is the scope of the rules. Uh, the second issue that's at controversy is the legal, legal framework for adoption of those rules. Um, and largely that's whether the commission bases its authority on uh, on a provision in the statute that directs the commission to take necessary steps to uh, foment broadband adoption. And I'd say that uh, I'd characterize it a little different than Sarah and say that the commission actually has very strong legal ground to move forward under 706. The D.C. Circuit said so. The question is um, how far they can go under 706 and what kind of rules they can adopt under 706. Uh, the second is um, uh, whether they they anchor their rules in the voice and telephony uh, uh, statutes that impose common carrier obligations. That's the Title II uh, framework. Uh, and the commission does raise some questions about that. The third is whether they f- anchor some of this in the rules, the statutes that apply to mobile services, Title III. And then lastly, there could be some other uh, theories of jurisdiction, ancillary jurisdiction, um, in, whether it's based on the 
cable statutes or or, or some other statute in Title One that they can use to um, to justify some part of the rules. So there's a lot that's been in the news about the legal foundation to the rules, but I think it's important to refocus some of this that, that really there's a lot of controversy on the scope of the rules still, and that's why the rules themselves, the proposed rules and the order that accompanies them are so long, it's almost 100 pages, because there's a lot in controversy and a lot that's been asked. All right, so Gus, uh, Matt, there's a lot, a lot said. I'm not going to tell you what you should, how you should respond, because there's a lot on the table, 706, Title II, wireless, fast lanes, prioritization, blocking, solutions, search of a problem. Feel free to comment. <laughs> Let me start with a couple of points, because I, I agree with a lot of what Markham said, but, but not everything. Um, in terms of the things that are are not in, uh, that, that are not in controversy, I, I, I wouldn't fully agree that everyone would say broadband providers have an incentive to cause harm. I mean, the, the, the view of many of my clients that provide broadband services is they're operating in, co- in a competitive environment. They want to provide the best possible service to their customers, and they understand that if they did something harmful to consumers, that they, there would be a real price to pay in the marketplace. I think most of us can realize today the old examples that were trotted out as, as, the, as the basis for, for net neutrality rules just would never happen. The, the old example when I was at the FCC was that what if a provider uh, denied access to Amazon.com and, and shifted traffic to BarnesandNoble.com? Or what if a provider, you know, shifted uh, your, your attempt to reach a certain website to, to the website of an affiliate? Uh, there would be a massive consumer backlash, congressional and FCC backlash. Such conduct would immediately be condemned, and it just wouldn't occur in today's marketplace. There are debates about the extent of competition in the marketplace, but I think we'd all agree there's enough competition that providers would never engage in that behavior, and I'd argue they have no incentive to. Um, there, I mean, there are fair debates a- a- about, um, you know, whether some of the priority arrangements that, that can be called discrimination or could be cause, called novel and innovative business arrangements, whether those are good for bad or consumers and whether there are incentives to engage in them. And I think I think Markham's right. A lot of the action in this proceeding is going to be about paid prioritization, the degree to which it should be regulated or not regulated. One point on that is I think it's, it's important to understand that um, there could be good prioritization from the standpoint of consumers or bad. Uh, it's easy to think of examples of both. Chairman Wheeler at his press conference yesterday said he's got priority access to the telephone network as, as an emergency government official, and, and we all should retain that sort of thing on the Internet. Or let's imagine a remote service where there's telemedicine going on and a, and a heart surgeon and uh, in, in, a, in a city is consulting with a patient in a remote area, and, and let's imagine that application needs high bandwidth and constant throughput, it would seem logical to prioritize that traffic over other forms of traffic that are less uh, latency sensitive, for example. At the other end of the spectrum, I think we'd all agree that if a, if a broadband provider had an exclusive arrangement to prioritize the traffic of its affiliated content service, that would be anti-competitive and something that should not occur in the marketplace and may be properly the subject of rules. So the point there, I think the takeaway is that prioritization itself is not inherently good or bad. It could be good or bad, depending on the context, depending on the competitive effects, depending on the consumer effects. And whether we're under Title II or whether we're under what we're calling Section 706, uh, I think the Commission has appropriately proposed to, to judge these things on a case-by-case basis. And the choice of legal authority isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to affect that in the end. They're, they're proposing, regardless of what legal authority they choose, to make context-specific case-by-case judgments about the appropriateness of certain behaviors, and I think that makes sense. I mean, one part of it that I think is missing from this debate, Markham mentioned the scope, is if we're worried about consumers having access to the content of their choosing, the threats to that openness certainly don't come only from broadband Internet access providers. And I'm interested in in hearing Sarah's view on this and, and groups that are arguing for open Internet protections seldom talk about threats from outside of broadband ISPs. But we have real-world examples occurring all the time. Last year and and this year in retransmission consent disputes and program carriage disputes, uh, content owners have withheld content from customers to essentially punish a cable provider that won't come to terms. And often consumers are collateral damage in that struggle. They can't, they couldn't get access during a retransmission consent dispute between CBS and Time Warner Cable to CBS content online because CBS withheld it from Internet access addresses belonging to Time Warner Cable. Even though some of those customers weren't Time Warner Cable video customers, they may have been over-the-air broadband viewers, they may have been DirecTV subscribers. And, and the odd thing from my perspective is that those who 
who support a role for government in, in promoting uh, openness don't seem to be talking about those sorts of those sorts of conduct, which are not hypothetical. They're they're actually occurring, and and. Um, so I, I think if we're going to have this debate about the role of government and, and, and if government is going to make judgments about what, what sorts of blocking or discrimination are, are good or bad, it's hard to have that debate without looking at other players in this ecosystem, without looking at whether uh, a, a content owner uh, or, or uh, you know, other service providers are, are themselves acting in ways that, that violate hmm. these principles. That's interesting. I wasn't expecting to hear retransmission consent in this discussion. Um, but, it, but it raises a question for later. I have thousands of questions. But Gus, um, you want to address the t- uh, elephant in the room? Uh, I will address several elephants uh, in the room. Uh, first, uh, I want to start by saying Mr. Brill is a wise and learned man, and you should listen to everything he said. I also would have brought up uh, retransmission consent as an example, um, and I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, mean, I guess the example, the metaphor is like, let's say uh, Google says that they're not going to allow their search service to be used by, uh, the analogy is, well, Google would not allow, you, you can, Time Warner can't use it, or Time Warner Cable can't use it, but um, Cox can uh, right. Over their internet service. Right. Or we may have that net, power. Or Netflix. Or Netflix could say, hey, Comcast cut us a better deal, or we're going to cut off Netflix to you, and your customers will be harmed as a Got result. Um, and there's a really interesting history here. The, the bottom line, the baseline to take away from this history is um, – the content side very frequently has as much or more market power than the distribution side. But we as a society, we like the content side. It seems valuable to us, so we tend to side with the content side. And this distribution stuff, it's boring. It's just copper or fiber in the ground. Why are they getting so much money? So if you go back and look to the uh, 19th century, the telegraph cases, there were there was major litigation, congressional investigation of the early uh, telegraph companies because it looked like they were uh, acting anti-competitively and harming the public in how they were treating the news agencies. And after a substantial investigation, what the government realized was, hey, this is really the AP. It's really the news agencies who are the bad actors here. And the entire uh, investigation shifted to focus on the AP. And this is in many ways the same dynamic. The, both the content side and the distribution side, these are big firms. These are big corporate entities. They're fighting stuff out. Um, very frequently, the consumer gets stuck in the middle, and very frequently, we turn to our initial attention, our initial blame to the distribution guys because we like the content guys. And then we realize, hey, it's actually the content guys who are exerting as much or more market power in a consumer-harming way. Now, to get back to the original question uh, that uh, th- this uh, time down the line started, is the open internet order a good thing or a bad thing? My general view here is it's a bad thing, but for a somewhat particular reason. We're going to, no matter what the commission does, unless it goes for the option that I outlined before, uh, initially that won't do, saying, no, we're not going to do anything here, what's going to result from whatever the commission does is another probably two to four years of litigation um, followed by or simultaneous with two to four years of bickering over the details of implementation just on jurisdiction and implementation issues without having a substantive issue before the commission. Um, The commission today does have authority to take action against um, the, a wide range of net neutrality violations and probably anything that they could ultimately take action against, they could take action against today under Section 706. And we would, so my preference would be for the Commission to say, okay, we're not going to make rules here, we're going to wait for a case by case, uh, a real problem to occur and adjust it on a case by case basis. And can, I, can you, I'm curious, can you give me examples of like what, 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 ex- what ex- like host of horribles um, can you name that um, the FCC right now has 706 authority? Given the Comcast bit, uh, Comcast decision, um, and given what they did in Madison River, which was sealed, um, what 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 do they have the authority to do right now? That so that the the Comcast example is a great example um, because I think if the current understanding of Section 706 as applying to the Internet were to have uh, been the uh, extant interpretation at the time of the Comcast BitTorrent case, that case very well could have come out quite differently. So the the court there dismissed the case largely on jurisdictional grounds. The FCC didn't have jurisdiction to enforce um, its policy statement, and there was also important discussion about the nature of a policy statement as binding rules. So I'm I'm confused. So you're saying that the the D.C. Circuit Court 
breathed new life into 706, like kind of that it didn't really so have. Bef- the FCC uh, breathed new light into 706. In the 2010 Open Internet Order, the FCC said, we're revising our prior understanding of Section 706 as not applying to the Internet, and it's our n- new understanding that it does apply to the Internet. And under um, basic principles of administrative law, agencies can change their prior interpretations. Um, and, in fact, there are two really important cases here. They're both FCC cases. The first is um, FOX 1, FCC v. Fox, um, uh, the 2000, a 2007 case where uh, Justice Scalia said agencies can change their prior interpretations um, of uh, their organic statute. Uh, the fact of a previous interpretation doesn't bar them from doing so. Um, and then Fox 2, a 2012 case um, where uh, the agency, uh, it was a fair notice case, this was the continuation of the prior um, Fox case, where uh, so long as uh, entities subject to a case-by-case adjudication have noticed that the agency might take action against them. The agency can take action against them, they in, and they can change the rules in an adjudicatory setting. Okay. And this dates back through uh, January 2, uh, a line of Supreme Court cases going back 60 years. Okay. And are you going to get to the elephant in the room, Title II? Uh, yes. Yes. Sure. Just one lightning round here. Okay. Okay. Light, light, lightning round, I, I basically I agree exactly with Matt. Okay. The question of uh, Section 706 versus Title II, this is a, a knob adjusting, on the one hand, the agency's burden of proof um, uh, with the uh, level of formality the agency needs to go through in order to enforce uh, the statute. Title, the, the key question with Title II um, is the uh, unjust and unreasonable discrimination uh, provision. There's a safety valve in there. There's expressed language saying it doesn't prohibit, uh, it only prohibits unjust and unreasonable uh, discrimination. And under Supreme Court case law, that's expressed language that would need to be given meaning. Okay. Um, I, well, I have a ton of questions. I do want to go, go to the audience for some questions. I think there's a... Sorry, can I respond a bit and you, can, you can respond. <laughs> In the meantime, get your questions ready. The fo- fellows from C-SPAN will come around with a boom mic, so just speak into the mic. So I want to talk a little bit first about what's different in these rules versus what was in the 2010 order and why that's important, particularly in light of this dialogue that has started to unfold about, you know, the beauty pageant of whether we like um, content providers or ISPs more and and why why the distinctions matter here from an economic um, standpoint. So I wanted to point out something that I think is interesting from a a structure standpoint of the proposed rulemaking, um, where the commission is trying to sort of track the buckets that were, that held the rules in the 2010 order. That was the transparency rule, the no blocking rule, and the non-discrimination rule. Interestingly, in this NPRM, they talk about the transparency rule and some adjustments they'll make to it, they propose to make to it. The no blocking rule, as it's modified here, and we can talk about specifics um, if, if folks would like. But then instead of going to the non-discrimination rule, they go to codifying an enforceable rule to protect the open Internet that is not common carriage per se. And this is important because this represents a really critical distinction that the D.C. Circuit um, pointed out, which was, You can do the rules, FCC, that you wanted to do in the 2010 order, but you can't do them, you can't apply them to non-common carriers. And this is why the FCC is sort of bending over backwards trying to figure out how to both protect against discrimination online, but to do so in a way that allows individualized bargaining and negotiation by carriers. So it's trying to do non-discrimination through rules that are essentially protect against the opposite, or apply the opposite of um, non-discrimination. And that's important here, and getting back to a point that Marka made at the beginning about things that are not, um, let's say, controversial from a legal standpoint in terms of what the 2010 order said and what the D.C. Circuit, um, you know, uh, sort of agreed with. And that is that um, there is a risk of discrimination by Internet service providers that would... Um, that could interfere with the advancement of um, the deployment of advanced telecommunication services online. And I want to talk about a, a bit about why that's true. When you have a broadband subscription in your home, you typically only have one for residential home broadband, correct? You don't you don't subscribe to both Comcast and uh, RCN in DC. You you pick one. So that creates what we call a terminating access monopoly, where 
to reach each subscriber of a given internet service provider's network, a content company has to negotiate or somehow interconnect and, and transmit their um, their content to the end users. They can do that in a number of different ways, and we can talk about those later as well. But the terminating access monopoly is really important here. And some of the other panelists might say that, oh, this terminating access monopoly is fiction because people have cell phones and they have all these other they have tablets that are 4G enabled. But I think that we can all sort of like reason, like think about this as reasonable people. I'm not going to watch, if I have a home broadband subscription, I'm not going to use my 4G service over my cell phone to watch Netflix videos. I, my source of, my primary source of connectivity at my home is my, um, wired ISP. And I may use my phone to, sometimes I use my phone to watch videos at night, but I do so not over my, um, Verizon 4G data plan. I do so over my Wi-Fi enabled um, network at home. And that's why we're concerned here. We're not concerned simply because we don't like ISPs. In fact, there's, I have no, nothing against ISPs in, in inherently. But I do have um, concerns about the way that the internet is structured and the way that we have seen historically internet service providers take advantage of this, their status in the market as um, ter terminating access monopolies. And so I wanted to, um, hopefully not take too much time, but I wanted to clarify the concern here and why it's specific to um, to internet service providers. Okay, but we are in the lightning round because we, we have to get to the, the spectrum. Um, you wanted to respond to something. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll do this lightning version. So uh, a couple of quick points. First, I Verizon hates me. I actually do watch a lot of Netflix over my Verizon 4G. Um, I'm a fortunate beneficiary of a grandfather data plan, so I understand not everyone can do that. Um, agreeing with Sarah, um, the the lack of competition in this market is real and important, and I, I think that is where real efforts should be focused. Um, so I think largely as we get competition, the net neutrality uh, concerns fall away. And the question is the basic Title II debate um, is largely driven by two worldviews. One is competition is not possible, so we need Title II. The other is competition is possible. We don't need Title II. We need to focus on competition. Um, the uh, key... Th uh, I want to respond also to an economic argument um, uh, that both Markham and Sarah have made here. And this goes back to the idea of the virtuous uh, circle. The virtuous circle is absolutely correct, but it can also go the other way. The real problem here is the virtuous circle describes what's known as a two-sided market. And the economic literature very, very consistently holds an, um, an unambiguously ambiguous result. Um, pay prioritization can harm consumers. It also can benefit substantially consumers. So the uh, by banning pay prioritization or going to a strong Title II model, we're foreclosing the possibility of certain business plans that could benefit consumers. Um, and if um, you look, can, I, can I just ask you to clarify? We've been talking about, you know, Matt laid it out very well what, what Title II was, um, but there seems to be a lot, a lot in the press, a lot of conversation is that Title II is this common carriage, and it was, it's, been, it's, it's been around for 80 years, and over that time, uh, common carriage uh, in telecommunications has a lot of things attached to it. Like over the years, there's layers and layers and layers of regulation. So sometimes people say, "Well, we're going back to 80 years um, rather than innovating." Um, what do they mean by that, and why is that not a problem? Just very quickly, and then maybe Markham can kind of say why is that not a problem in this particular proceeding. So the, the basic uh, question with Title II is, we don't know what will happen. The Title II has a lot of um, provisions that would, by virtue of reclassification, automatically apply to the internet ecosystem, and the FCC would need to go through a process of waiving most of them. Okay. Um, um, and it's not, there would be a lot of fights. It's called forbearance. Right, for, it would need to go through this forbearance process. It's not clear. There would be a lot of fights over what needed to get forborne. And as companies develop new business plans, this is a really important transition uh, that I'm about to uh, suggest here. If agencies want to develop new business plans, they might need to go to the FCC and affirmatively get approval through forbearance, which can take up to 15 months, um, in order to develop new business plans. So I've heard, I've heard the model is you innovate. If it's bad, you get sued. All right. So once you get approval, then you can innovate. So innovation, I've been heard, innovation by permission. Do you think that's right, Markham? Well, excuse me. I think that what what one thing that's correct is that there is literature that says that a two-sided market can be beneficial. And that's where I sort of disagree with Sarah and that I think Chairman Wheeler, uh, I think clearly in the NPRM, is embracing uh, paid prioritization. He's not trying to figure out a way to get out of it. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's 
arguing that uh, or proposing that uh, there can be benefits. He's not saying it should be necessarily the norm, that there ought to be a base level of service and that there would be paid prioritization. So I think th- that debate, the, whether, you know, the scope of the rules, I think has to be a predicate before we get into whether we want to be in 706 or Title II or some other category. So it's hard to say ex ante which, which theory I, I would jump to until you first decide what vision for the Internet you'd like to have. And, and, Fair point. and the Commission has proposed uh, the questions on whether they think affirmative paid prioritization and those models um, are, are, are good or, or not. The, the 2010 NPRM didn't prohibit per se paid prioritization, but it gave a strong indication that paid prioritization would be frowned upon heavily uh, if looked at. Um, so I think, I think that's, you know, that will, um, that, that uh, the first part of the answer to the first question will necessarily inform the answer to the second question. A couple points on Title II since it's so central to this debate. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about it. One is this isn't a a policy-driven choice that the FCC has total discretion to make. Some some advocates talk as if, you know, if we're not happy with the content of the rules, we'll just pick Title II just to, to drive a certain result. And that's really not how the law works. What the FCC did in classifying cable modem service in 2002 and classifying DSL and other wireline fiber-based uh, broadband services in 2005, wireless services and, and all other forms thereafter, was to look very closely at how the service is provided to the consumer, to analyze the functions and to make a technical determination of how that fits under the under the Communications Act. And the Supreme Court affirmed it on that basis, saying it's the factual particulars of the service that drive the classification. So the FCC can't just disregard facts and say we would prefer a different outcome. I mean, to be sure, if the FCC had a record showing that Internet service is provided differently today and those functions aren't what they were, um, that might justify a different result. But I don't think that's the case. The technologists that I talk to, the network owners I talk to, say there's really nothing fundamentally different about the way Internet services are structured. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. But but also, to Tim's question, I mean, there is an enormous amount of baggage with with Title II, and it has historically required tariffing of services, price regulation, service quality regulation, and just um, an an intensely regulatory framework that many people feel is just ill-suited for the dynamic, competitive Internet ecosystem. The FCC has tried to address those concerns by saying we can forbear or or, or waive some of these provisions, but in my experience, having been at the FCC and having been an advocate before the FCC, that would generate a ton of uncertainty about whether that forbearance is going to work, whether it's going to stick, whether a court's going to uphold it, whether a future commission's going to undo it. So a lot of that uncertainty is the concern. And, and finally, there is a huge spillover risk. If the FCC looks at, at transmission in, in Internet access and tries to pull it out and say that transmission is going to be viewed henceforth as a separate regulated common carrier telecom service, well, guess what? Everybody else in the Internet ecosystem is providing transmission too. So content delivery networks like Akamai and Limelight, Backbone providers, Cogent and Level 3 that have always been providing services on an unregulated basis outside of Title II, and even edge providers, large ones with their own networks like Google and Facebook and, and, and many others, all are providing transmission to get their content from uh, servers to, to ISP. So there would be an enormous destabilizing risk that if you're going to say one piece of transmission within the Internet is going to be regulated for the first time as a telecom service, well, then many other forms of Internet transmission likewise might be regulated as uh, as telecom services. So from my standpoint, having watched this debate, I think if the FCC wants to achieve certain protections, and we now have a rough consensus, a lot of the broadband providers are willing to agree with the FCC on, on certain baseline no-blocking rules and certain uh, review procedures to ensure commercially limited, uh, commercially reasonable, and, 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 and you know, otherwise... Um, appropriate arrangements. I, I think we can forge a consensus around that, but Title II is something that won't ever lead to consensus. Is going to lead to tremendous uncertainty and, and fighting. So Matt has hit on a very interesting point, which I think is in many ways one of the things that will be the undercurrent of the debate, which is where do you want to see uncertainty lie? And AT&T in its argument said, that they think there's too much uncertainty with the commercially reasonableness standard, and they said it's going to lead to their uh, litigation over the deals that they arrange and uh, uncertainty about what kind of arrangements that they get into. And then they propose a safe harbor that says that if uh, if uh, if it's not affiliated, if they're not in, in, in engaging in, a, in, a, in an agreement with an affiliated provider or it's not affiliated content, that there should be a, uh, some sort of... Um, 
uh, uh, rule that that would be uh, okay as long as there's this baseline of internet service. They want to put a finger on some certainty there. So I think we are in, it, we've had 10 years of litigation and rulemaking because this is an, uns it, it, it is a debate about where the uncertainty lies. Is it with consumers that, are, you know, are maybe nervous about access to the content in the same way they've gotten to, edge providers that are nervous that they're going to have to pay more or that they may have to be forced into relationships to pay when they haven't before, ISPs that are worried that they may be foreclosing potential revenue sources, or whether under Title II uh, the FCC can get the forbearance issues right. And I think I would argue that's where it's going to be impossible to get to consensus about all of those, and it's the job of the regulator to figure out how to bridge those gaps uh, after the right policy has been determined. I, I did, speaking of forbearance, um, we were supposed to start the Spectrum uh, round um, five minutes ago. So if I could, Tim Donovan and Allison, uh, if you for, could forbear a few more minutes, I, I did ask, uh, I did say I could grant one, grant a few questions. Anybody in the audience has a question for the open internet folks? Uh, and they're going to bring a, moon, a boom mic over to you. You're not going to hear it in the speakers, but it, it is live. So just raise your hand and ask, ask a question. Uh, yeah, um the Netflix deal. Some I heard that uh, the Netflix to Comcast deal, in fact, does not touch the internet. That it's a private line between them, and so it's from Netflix network to the Comcast network. In terms of paid prioritization, would people, in fact, be able to do these side deals where they do direct to direct lines completely? Uh, bypassing the, quote, public internet? Well, I think I let um, the legal experts answer that. Probably it's like paragraph 89 or 90. Um, but I will say that when Chairman Wheeler was walking out and uh, so someone from the press asked him about that specific question, he said this does not apply to the Netflix deal. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Let me try to explain why quickly. Um, these open internet rules are aimed at governing the connection between the Internet service provider and the consumer, what's often called the last mile. And so when we talk in that context about paid prioritization, what we're saying is that AT&T should not be allowed to cut a deal with Netflix that will speed up the delivery of Netflix traffic over that last mile compared to other services, or now we're going to have a debate about whether such an arrangement in some circumstances might be reasonable. But, but, the, but the interconnection between networks, between Netflix directly with Comcast or between Comcast with an intermediary like Cogent, is something that the FCC said is outside of these rules. That's often called the peering debate, uh, based on peering relationships or interconnection debate. And the, those are, are likely to be scrutinized independent of open Internet proceeding um, in, in other contexts. There's a lot of activity around that at the FCC, but I think the, the chairman has said definitively it's not part of the net neutrality proceeding, and I think that's that's the correct approach. Just jump in. And so uh, I represent Netflix. So I'll give you just, uh, full disclosure on that, but I'd say that um, although the uh, chairman has proposed the NPRM not to extend the rules to those interconnection agreements, it does ask whether it should do so. Um, and the argument for those that say it, it should is if, let's say, you have rules that prevent some kind of arrangement where in the last mile um, uh, the AT&T or the ISP is not able to extract a new charge from the edge provider, the content provider, but they could do so outside of the last mile. Um, so they're able to accomplish outside of the last mile, but they couldn't accomplish inside the last mile. That's the argument for why it should be extended. Whether And, and whether the FCC will agree that with that view uh, or not, or whether they think it has to be in a different proceeding, we don't know yet. But I, certainly those there will be advocates that say it has to be, those issues have to be addressed in this proceeding. I, I would add, too, that I think that the fact that the, the Netflix Comcast arrangement is, is coming up as a controversy in light of the net neutrality debate is evidence, A, that the, the net, network neutrality rules um, worked. Um, in that they protected the, the network from the, on the last mile towards the end user from unreasonable discrimination. Um, and in fact, that discriminatory, discriminatory behavior and pressure points moved um, simply to a different point in the network. And so the, the worry here is that, again, given the Internet service providers terminating access monopoly to the end user, that is, they are the only pipe to each individual user, they have the ability to not just extract fees from content companies or CDNs or whomever, but they can extract fees that are not grounded in um, 
uh, market-driven rates. They can essentially charge a toll um, based on, on what they, they believe they can they can charge. I agree with charging. just want to respond quickly because I, I just think that's fundamentally wrong. I, I, I think it's important to understand that, that uh, there isn't one pipe that Netflix has available. And, and I think what made this deal possible is a marketplace where Netflix, in the case of Comcast, actually has 40 separate routes into Comcast networks. So we have backbone providers like Level 3 and Cogent. We have content delivery networks of the likes of Akamai and Limelight. And uh, historically, Netflix has used all of those routes to transmit traffic. It perceived its own economic benefit as cutting out the middleman. And instead of relying on a Cogent, coming up with an economic arrangement in which it did a direct deal where it lowers its cost structure. No, no one made Netflix do that. Netflix came up with the idea. Netflix is saving money. So I really resist the idea that somehow um, net neutrality had anything to do with that or somehow there was any coercion in that. Think about it in common sense. Netflix is in an ideal position with merger proceedings pending and net neutrality proceedings pending. If it wanted to use the regulatory process to avoid a deal like that, it had enormous opportunities. They voluntarily went into a commercial arrangement because they they thought it was a good deal for them. And putting on my engineering hat for a moment, um, this is a nice demonstration of an important point about the technical architecture of the Internet. And when you talk to uh, the technologists, they will tell you, the engineers will tell you that the Internet is not neutral. There is, it isn't a concept that has a technological meaning. And one of the reasons for this is the physical design of the network, where you connect, where you interconnect, um, has a great deal of influence over how uh, effectively, different sources of traffic traffic will be handled by the internet. Um, it, it, I want to highlight that uh, it's nothing new for Netflix or for anyone to use a private connection to connect to uh, or bypass parts of the public network. This, in fact, is what Level 3's business model for a long time in their content delivery business has been. Uh, they have a private fiber network that they use to allow firms to bypass the congestion of the public internet, the various peering points um, and uh, latency issues, and directly connect with the uh, destination ISPs. But so that, that's not a, a engineering, from an engineering perspective, an atypical sort of uh, design. Uh, but I think Matt raises the, the factual question, which will have to be addressed in the rulemaking. So if those 40 routes are congested, if a program is so popular that you have used up all the capacity and the ISP says that uh, you'll have to pay us to open up another port to gain the capacity to freeze our users, um, that's the first question. The second one is, is that rate subject to market forces, or is the ISP able to, to choose a number uh, based on super competitive uh, uh, business models? So that will be the question in the docket. And a really nice twist on that, though, is we, from an antitrust perspective, we generally focus on um, – uh, power to set prices. Netflix is in a different sort of uh, position. They're in a position to set congestion because they represent such a significant portion of the traffic going through those interconnection points that they have a different form of market power there. They can really set the congestion levels. So that will be the question in the docket. <laughs> So, Allison and Tim have been, they've really, they've really been patient with me. I really appreciate it. Um, there are so many questions I want to ask, and I think there's like five questions in the audience that people want to ask about the open internet rules. Perhaps if, if the, the panelists stick around for just a little bit while we, we go to the spectrum round, um, we can perhaps at, at the end, you can, you can come about ask questions of the open internet folks. Um, I think going forward, it is the beginning of the process. There are many questions. I still don't, there's still things in this order that are, I, I notice a proposal we're making that I don't even fundamentally understand and I've been working on this a long time. So when I hear that congressional staff feel like they, they understand or they, they have the metaphor right um, about what the what open, the open internet order is, um, I think that it needs a deeper dive because the, these issues are very, very important and it could have consequences one way or the other um, even if you don't take a position on it. So um, just... We'll be keep doing this as we go forward. I beg your forgiveness for um, having, it be, if it's Friday, it's Net Neutrality Day. But we'll be doing more briefings as we go forward. I want to thank the Open Internet folks, but quickly pivot to um, the other thing the Federal Communications Commission did yesterday, which was basically the, the direction of, of Congress, was to, to find ways to open up um, Spectrum. Again, this is about having more robust Internet services. There's a, on the right side of the table here, there's a concern, perhaps, that, they'll, they, that we won't get access 
access to the services for, for whatever reason, maybe bad behavior on the part of ISPs. Um, on the left side of the table here, we have um, folks to talk about what the FCC did yesterday, which was to open up or try to open up a massive um, set of spectrum, which is the kind of uh, oxygen for our mobile devices so that we could have more wireless connectivity. Um, and and so for, for to speak on that particular topic, we have Allison Remsen from Mobile Future. Um, we also have Tim Donovan, Donovan from the Competitive Carriers Association. And we're just going to lay, lay out what the FCC did yesterday. Um, based in, in, in short, um, the, the, the FCC basically in, induced or incentivized um, the TV broadcasters to kind of give up um, the, the spectrum that they own as a, a public airways, um, and in which case they'd kind of auction it off for better mobile um, uh, services and more broadband. And um, the, the question, there was a lot of concern going into it um, about what the FCC would come up with. Would it be a good rule that kind of was fair market uh, based and, 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 and addressed everything else? Or would they have put their thumb too hard on the scale and in and, 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 and favor one or one company over another when it came to these auctions? You know, does, it, does the best bidder win or is it is um, government kind of skewing it a little bit or do they find it a balance? Um, and so that happened. That, that is a different thing. Uh, it's a was a report and order that they made yesterday. Um, yesterday on the open internet, there was a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, which kind of goes on and on and on and on. Uh, the order uh, is a little bit closer to fruition, and, and I have Allison and Tim to kind of tell us like what exactly happened and, and where and they might have disagreements about the best that what the approach the FCC took. But let's just lay out for the first you know, five minutes what did the FCC do yesterday on that? Sure. So, so thanks, Tim and. Um so I'm here on behalf of Competitive Carriers Association. We represent over 100 wireless carriers, ranging from Sprint and T-Mobile to some very small um, rural wireless providers. Um, I think the size of the, the market share of different carriers can be shown that either AT&T or Verizon alone serves more customers and controls more customers than all of my members combined um, for the 100-plus carriers. Um, and so we, we – I think it also shows how big of a meeting it was at the FCC yesterday that both of these topics were discussed because both of these have been topics of several hearings on their own um, up here on the Hill and on both sides and in several different committees. And uh, I know that both will remain uh, a hot topic moving forward. I know you had asked uh, how did we get here in about two minutes. I'm going to try and pare it back to about one minute. Great. Um, so looking back, going back to 1981, the FCC made the, the first cellular licenses available. It was, it was 50 megahertz of cellular spectrum. Um, and that was divided up in each market between two providers with one of the licenses going to the incumbent wireline phone company, um, the other going to a competitor. In, in 94, um, Congress broke up this first duopoly um, by providing the FCC with, with auction authority. Um, this was big, and this passed, as we'll see, a, a common theme here, um, as a pay-for. We could probably have a whole session on how Spectrum is more than a pay-for, but for getting Spectrum legislation through, an important aspect is that, that Spectrum is, is a huge pay-for because it generates a lot of revenue for the Treasury for use of a finite taxpayer-owned goal. Um, so we had the through the 94 omnibus set up the 120 megahertz of, of PCS Spectrum, which we brought to the market, and that brought in um, new competitors. Uh, for example, the Sprint today is, exists because of the, the PCS auction as well as several other of, uh, of my members. Um, this auction authority was, was expanded in, in the Balanced Budget Act of 97. Again, none of these really say the Spectrum Act of so-and-so. Um, and then the, the last major um, huge spectrum auction was 700 megahertz spectrum, um, which was created through the DTV switch, where switching to, from analog to digital TV, you were able to repack broadcasters and free up some prime low-band spectrum. Moving forward, at, from that point, um, for several years, we had discussion of, of S-911 in the Senate, the, the jump-starting opportunities for broadband spectrum in the House, um, ways at looking at um, setting up this incentive auction, uh, a framework that came out through the FCC's broadband uh, plan, um, at how you could incentivize broadcasters to relinquish some spectrum or to share some spectrum, to free up more spectrum to, to fuel the mobile broadband networks that consumers are increasingly using. Um, and... We talked about how net neutrality was an NPRM adopted yesterday. Uh, the Congress adopted the, the Spectrum Act portion of another big pay-for package in, in early 2012. Um, that NPRM was adopted September of 2012. Um, through the, the lobbying and, and notice and comment proceeding, uh, leading to a report and order that was adopted yesterday. There's, there's still some work to do on some of the, the fine points, but the general framework for the auction and for Spectrum Holdings was updated Yesterday, which which finds us um, here without a, a full, you know, several trees 
order to read through at this point, but with a general uh, sense from the commission in the meeting yesterday about the direction that they're looking to go with incentive auctions. So they didn't actually publish the order. They gave a preview of the order. Yes. Um, even though it was an order, the notice of proposals we're making, they actually published the rulemaking even though it was 110 pages. That seems weird, but... I'd be surprised if we come in at 110 pages. <laughs> okay. So it's a, big, it's a big deal. A lot of stuff in there, a lot of which would be probably too much for the scope of this. But just generally, um, let me just ask Allison, you know, does, how does this benefit consumers? How does it benefit you know, app companies, um, uh, mobile providers, et cetera? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that this is... Uh, the order coming out today was really great news for, for pretty much everyone, anyone who has ever sat staring at their phone at that loading symbol of doom, hoping to connect or, you know, have an app timeout. I mean, this is really good news. Um, this is, you know, as Tim laid out, this is a process that we've been working on for years now, trying to get through the, the commission. We've all seen this tremendous growth in the apps economy and uh, through all kinds of mobile services that we're increasingly relying on and depending on going forward. And I think that, uh, you know, from our perspective at Mobile Future, we represent uh, kind of a broad swath of the wireless ecosystem. Um, carriers, AT&T and Verizon, our members, some equipment suppliers, a lot of app developers, other folks who are doing really innovative work in mobile. So for all of our members, this was a, a good moment and a good opportunity to, to know that there will be spectrum in the pipeline, you know, several years down the road. But, uh, you know, from our view, it was interesting to see, um, you know, the, the – the commission, the chairman, all of the commissioners, uh, and and the commission staff really spent a lot of time on this, trying to uh, move this item forward. And I think that uh, I think that having more spectrum in the pipeline, uh, even though it's going to take several years to reclaim from the broadcast, they set out a very complicated process to get here. So it's no wonder that we might not see the order for a few days. But there's a lot of moving parts here, and I think at the end of the day, this is good news for for all consumers and wireless users, and particularly for mobile innovation. So this process takes a long time. You have to say to the broadcaster as well, they have to say, well, I'm going to give up my spectrum, sell it back to, or give it back to the, the, the government. The government's going to have an auction. People are going to buy it. The, the broadcasters will get compensated. And then the people that actually get the spectrum then have to kind of build out networks based on those frequencies, on that. So it's this huge process, right? And I guess the concern was that there's very few companies or, or institutions with the wherewithal financially and technically or, or and, and the employees to actually do that, um, capitalize, have the infrastructure. And I guess the, but the concern is, like, shouldn't we have innovation or, or, or younger, smaller companies be able to get into this game? And I guess there was talk about maybe adjusting the rules so that you could have other companies with less capital and with, with less wherewithal actually get into that game. Does, did the order address that balance at all? It, it did. Um, and I think the, the fact that the fact that we're, we're both here praising the order is a, a strong testament to the work that, that the chairman, that, that the commission, that, that the task force and the bureaus all, all did to, to get this right. Um, a couple of points that they did that will really help innovative companies be able to participate in this auction. Um, a big one was the size, the geographic size of licenses offered. Um, if you only offer a spectrum piece that covers the entire nation, there's very few uh, networks and carriers that would be able to bid for that. Um, we, on behalf of our, our smallest members, we had pushed for so small cellular market areas. There's 700, some of those in the nation. They're, they're more granular. Um, the original FCC proposal would ask for economic areas. There's, there's less of them, but the problem there is that they're all tied to economic areas. Um, through a, a compromise proposal, we were able to reach partial economic areas, which allow rural carriers to provide service in, in their home markets um, while still allowing larger carriers to, to piece together the puzzle pieces to serve a larger footprint where necessary. So that was a, a big step to allow some of the smaller innovative companies um, to be able to participate in a general threshold issue to getting into the auction room. Um, the other big one was was the reserve spectrum, and this was a, a much lobbied and fairly controversial aspect of, of what the, the FCC adopted. Um, what, what happens there is that after a threshold price is reached, where FirstNet has all of their funding, sufficient funding, sufficient funds to, to move the broadcasters that have um, volunteered to participate in this process, um, then 
above and beyond that, up to 30 megahertz of spectrum will be reserved for um, those that are not dominant carriers in those areas to make sure that they are able to gain access to this this important spectrum and be able to build out networks. So uh, let me ask Allison, uh, Senator Thune and several of the members of the, the Senate, Senator Thune is our co-chair um, of the Congressional Internet Caucus, he sent a letter uh, you know, expressing concern about you know government uh, the government you know favoring uh, some companies over others when it comes to this uh, spectrum auction. Um, did you think? Did you know that today you'd have so you'd, you'd like this order so much? That, did you know that yesterday or two days before? Yeah, no, I know. I think uh, I think it's interesting that we are here together, kind of uh, in the same place on this order. I, we had opposed any type of. Uh, of mechanism that would put the thumb on the scale for anyone or, or prevent anyone from participating in the open auctions. You know, we've had a long track, work, track record of auctions here in this country, and open auctions have been very successful. So I think the biggest takeaway for me, though, out of yesterday is that, you know, neither Tim nor my carrier members got everything that they wanted out of it. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we saw among all of our members, I think, some very strong interest in participating in these auctions, and that is critical. We need both, you know, very vibrant participation on the wireless side, and we also need very strong participation on the broadcast side. And I know that, you know, we've been watching, the broadcasters have been watching this process kind of warily to see what the activity is going to be, what is going to be at stake here. We were very encouraged to see, you know, the commission is going to be spending a lot of time uh, over the summer and going into the fall to help answer the broadcaster's questions, and I think that at the end of the day, I think we're going to have a, a pretty vibrant auction and, and broad participation on both sides. There's also, you mentioned in your in just how we got here, the, the Budget Act, and, and, and there's, a, there's a financial uh, uh, the American budget and um, balanced budget and, and, and revenues, there's a big question about how the auctions play into our federal coffers. Right, so um, there, there's a big uh, aspect of this that's financial. That you need to raise enough money in the auction um, to cover money that we've already budgeted. Is that correct? So, is that is it, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. So there's an interesting dynamic at play here, where or spectrum policy is passed as a pay for, and then on the other hand, Congress has also explicitly directed the FCC not to look at revenue as one of the factors. Um, the FCC is directed to look at making sure there's not an excessive concentration of spectrum and to make sure that small businesses and rural carriers are able to access spectrum. Um, and I think a lot of that is because Congress realizes that spectrum is very valuable, and uh, with a good auction structure, carriers will be showing up to bid. Um, it sends a strong message to the broadcasters when carriers ranging from AT&T to public service wireless serving a, a rural piece of Georgia outside of Macon all came out with statements yesterday saying that with the rules adopted, they are interested in participating. Um, and for a, a broadcaster who's looking at, at you know what's coming and seeing, well, is this a good opportunity for me? Is it not? When you see hundred plus wireless carriers say, "I'm I'm in it," and you know I'm going to show up and I'm going to play, um, that sends a strong signal that, that there's a they should take a good hard look at, at participating. Um, so, so the FCC did not do this with a view to maximize the amount of money they make. Uh, what, what if it was a total failure? <laughs> <laughs> well, that I mean, that no one wants it to to fail. Everyone, of course, wants it to be a success. The you know, c Congress laid out some pretty key objectives here to fund a, a public safety network and then also to pay down uh, the deficit. And so, you know, of course, we want to make sure that we're able to meet those goals and exceed those goals and and to raise as much revenue as possible for the auction. Uh, you know, I think. I, that the order and the kind of the roadmap that we've seen, we haven't seen the details of it, but I think that, you know, from what folks have heard so far, they're definitely very interested in participating and, and see this as a great opportunity on the wireless side, and hopefully the broadcaster will see it as a great economic opportunity as well. And you, you'd mentioned one of the, the oversight letters. There was a, there were several that came in, and I'll, I'll also throw in another uh, co-chair where or Congressman Eshoo weighed in um, with a, another group of her colleagues, stating how the, these goals are not mutually exclusive. And you know, a well-structured auction that brings a lot of carriers to the table can raise significant revenue. Um, if we look at, at past as an experience, then the the spectrum blocks in the auctions that had the, the largest number of carriers bidding brought in by far the most revenue. Um, it's when you have the, the very large licenses and, and other reasons why carriers aren't, aren't interested in, in participating that you see the cost drive down by making sure that there's a, a meaningful opportunity for a carrier that, that shows up and plays by the rules and, and 
brings their money to the auction has a chance to walk away with something is in itself an, an enticement for carriers to show up and, and help have that frothy bidding environment that leads to high revenues. So is it fair to say that you're here today saying that the process that started in Congress, that flowed down to the, the commission, the way they went through their rulemaking and, and now come up with their report and order, it worked? I mean, I, you know, we're everyone's waiting to see the order. Everyone, you know, wants to see the auction succeed and wants to see how it goes. I think it might be premature to, okay. to take a victory lap at this point until we get through the auction process and make sure that we're, you know, that everyone's participating and then we are able to reclaim as much spectrum as possible. The, the last thing I, I just want to add here is we're, we're focused on the carriers, but, you know, really what is at stake here is for all the wireless users out there and the innovation that we're seeing from companies across the country, around the world, and making sure that, you know, the networks can support that traffic and anticipate what's going to be coming down the road four or five years from now. Yeah, and, and that's why this spectrum is so important for the consumers is that this – all spectrum is not created equal. This is the – if you think of repurposing broadcast, broadcast spectrum, think of setting up rabbit ears in the basement of a house and being able to get a signal. Um, this spectrum goes longer distances, giving it great coverage in rural areas, and also has great in-building penetration for when you're, for example, in a hearing room, um, being able to, to use your device or okay. when you're at home watching Netflix. So it's like mobile broadband on spectrum, on, on steroids. Yes. Yeah. Can I, I, we have like one or two minutes. Can I, I can go to the audience for a question on the incentive auctions. Um, and otherwise, I do have a kind of a weird question. Um, why is it that that the broadcasters um, got the spectrum for free, uh, you know, with certain kind of public interests? And this is a larger macro question with with public interest requ- requirements and obligations. Um, but the mobile carriers have to purchase at a huge expense. Um, and now when the broadcasters give it up, they get compensated for giving up a resource that they didn't actually buy in the first place. And and why would, if it seems like it's kind of skewed towards promoting, you know, video service, which is broadcast, right? Um, or, 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 or radio. But I assure you, like, right now, using my mobile spectrum, I have tweeted about this event. I tweeted that every, this event was going to be on C-SPAN. I actually emailed people um, during this thing. All those things are really important in my work. Um, and if I were watching TV at home, it would probably be divorce court or something. Um, why? <laughs> it just seems kind of... Can you want to weigh in on that one? Or? Well, I mean, it, it, I think it's important to, to look back at you know, how we got here, that it wasn't until that, that 94 uh, that Congress looked and said, hey, we shouldn't be just allocating the spectrum, giving it to different stakeholders. We should be auctioning this off and, and having some market forces at play. Um, within a, a competitive framework to make sure that you're able to have multiple competitors, um, but rather than just turning over this, this very, very valuable and very finite resource, you can't turn on a spectrum machine and, and make more spectrum. This is it. Um, so it's it's a way to, to make sure that um, there are market forces at play to entice the, the broadcasters to actually show up and, and take a good look at this. Um, and I think the FCC deserves a lot, a lot of credit, and Congress as well, for setting up a structure where, where the only options aren't Continue being a broadcaster where you are or turn off your station. Um, they, they finished a, a test recently showing that spectrum sharing works for broadcasters. Um, and there is a pathway forward for a broadcaster to, to stay on the air, to serve their same customers, um, and to receive a, a portion of, of the auction revenue without uh, changing their business plan. Awesome. Ton award. No, I just think this is a great opportunity for the broadcasters also to kind of rethink their business models. Everything else is evolving, and and this is a, a good opportunity for for you know the wireless community and for the broadcasters. And look forward to seeing it play out and, well. And Tim, I, you know, so there's there's huge benefits for consumers. You'll be able to, to tweet out more. There's huge <laughs> benefits for um, for taxpayers and for the treasury when those revenues do come in. But because this auction is structured in a way to increase competition, we're also looking at about a $200 billion benefit to the economy by having competition in the wireless industry. Um, so it serves a lot of goals, and there's a lot of wins here. So the linchpin is that the broadcasters have to give up their spectrum and be incentivized to give up their spectrum. So since we're speaking to a broader audience here, we would say to your local TV stations and broadcasters, please give up your spectrum. 
Um, and seeing as we're saying this, voluntary. <laughs> it's purely voluntary. Give it up. And seeing as we're saying this over uh, C-SPAN, which is a service provided by cable, I think that's fair, right? So, um, but let me just, um, I guess, I guess for both of the, the, the speakers, I want to thank you. And I, I think, I think frankly, no matter how you feel about it, you have to at least thank the folks down at the Federal Communications Commission for a brutal couple of, you know, months. Um, and they're going to go into another brutal couple of months uh, going forward. So, uh, sympathies to them and also our thanks. And thanks to the Congressional Network caucus and its co-chairs, Senators Thune and Leahy, and, and Congresswoman Eshoo and Goodlad in the House side. And, and thanks to all the speakers. I really appreciate it. Thank you.